Okay, uh, hopefully this is working. Um, yeah, looks like it's working. Okay, um, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about the Industrial Revolution um, and the changes that brings about in world economies and thus the changes that brings about in world politics and um, our notion of who gets what in a society. Um, so a huge amount changes when we develop this new means of making stuff. Um, and we can look at this from lots of different angles. An interesting one is life expectancy, which never really went above 35. Um, I'm nearly 35, so it's a scary thought. Um, education was something that was restricted to very few people. We began to see this last week when we looked at the people who framed the US Constitution and how they made up a very small elite, a very small percentage of society. So when we're talking about people reading Burke and Rousseau and Locke, um, this isn't your average a uh, farmer. This is um, a very small group of people who are forming an elite and they're the people who are framing lots of the politics of the time. Um, most people never really went more than a few miles from their home. They never owned anything substantial. They never traveled faster than a horse could go. Um, they lived on or near where their food came from and they probably never moved that far from where they grew up. Um, before the Revol Industrial Revolution, 80% of people would work in agriculture. Now, what really changes in the Industrial Revolution is the source of energy and what we can use that energy to do. So once we develop an internal combustion engine, uh, we can burn things and we can use the heat that's generated by burning things to move things. And very quickly, once we work this out, we work out that we can move all kinds of things and automate all kinds of processes that used to have to be done by hand. And this change in the means of production is absolutely crucial in changing society towards what we see it as today. Um, and the society that it develops uh, is one that we can call industrial capitalism, right? Um, it's a system whereby machines do a large amount of the labor and capital buys those machines. So capital is investment money right you can look at capital as, as money and what happens in capitalism is that by spending your money on machines you can get more money and so it helps to explain this with a little diagram i think so um let me see if i can find a program that i can draw this with uh draw no paint paintbrush great okay um, so what we see when we develop capitalism is, I've got my paintbrush here, right? Um, the inputs uh, go, that go to making a finished good, so let's say we're making a mug, uh, are raw materials and labor, right? Uh, labor plus raw materials with the use of a machine, so let's multiply it by a machine. Uh, this is our machine, goes to a finished good, right? Um, the raw material for this mug might be clay, right? Uh, the labor comes from the working classes. We're going to look at this later. Uh, so, this is a working class, and the machine this is owned by the person who had the money to purchase the machine, right? Now let's say this mug sells for ten dollars. Uh, let's say the raw materials for it cost one dollar, and two dollars is the cost of the labor, right? Two dollars is the cost of what we have to pay uh, a worker to work for ten minutes to make this mug. Let's say this machine costs you a dollar a day to run and another dollar a day to finance, right? So say you have to pay for it and you're paying off that loan. Well, let's say your costs now in total are one plus two plus two, which equals five. Um, and this is selling for 10, right? So you have a surplus five pounds or dollars or whatever you're working in. This money accrues to the person who owns the machine, right? So this is the capitalist, right? The capitalist is the person who has the capital, who has the investment money to buy the machine and therefore who gets the profit afterwards. And um, these people are referred to in Marxism as the bourgeoisie, right? The people to whom the surplus value accrues. These people do not make any more money, right? They are paid a day rate or an hourly rate or a piece rate. 
Um, but they don't get the surplus value that the machine generates. They just get whatever their wage is. And so through this system of capitalism, this group, the bourgeoisie, get richer and richer and richer, uh, the more the more it's made. These people continue to remain relatively poor. They just paid whatever their wage rate is. And we get more stuff, right? More mugs or more cars or washing machines or iPhone, whatever number they're on now. Um, but this process is called capitalism. Understanding that process hopefully will help you understand a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so one thing that stimulates this is an increase in agricultural productivity. So we look a little bit at how um, in agriculture uh, there was a change in how many people we could feed because of the change in crops that we had, right? A lot of the crops that came for the Americans, things like potatoes and corn, allowed us to feed more people off a small area of land. And what that does is allows the population to grow and allows people to not work in agriculture. And if one person can provide enough food for five people, then those other four people can do other things, right? And, and that one person can sell the food to them and then they have money, right? As opposed to a subsistence system. In a subsistence system, we all grow our own food and then we eat the food that we grow. And none of us have money to buy things. In this new system, one farmer grows the food. He sells the food, he has money, he uses the money to buy things like shoes and coats whereas previously he'd have made his own shoes and coats. And the other four people who aren't working in agriculture, well, now they can work as shoemakers or coat makers. And so we get better shoes, better coats, and better food because everyone's specializing in what they're doing, right? And um, people also develop the idea of investment for profit and the idea that people will invest in something and expect to get a greater return on it. Um, along with this comes the idea of the interest maximizing consumer. That's a person who tries to get the most return from their dollar spent, right? This sort of fictional figure who informs um, the ideas of, of economic capitalism. So it's steam power in the Industrial Revolution that really transforms industry. Um, it builds on one thing after another uh, in gradual development until what steam engine is developed. Um, the engine is built based on uh, another engine, which is made by Newcomen, um, but it's hugely more efficient, right? Four or five times more efficient. Um, it uses about 20, 25% as much coal. Um, the value of this is it allows for more coal mining, because when you dig a hole in the ground, maybe not in California, but in lots of places, it fills with water, right? Um, this coal engine is now efficient enough that it will clear the water um, so that it uh, doesn't fill up the mine without using so much coal that it's not worth mining. Um, so this allows for more coal to be dug and then that coal is used to power steam factories, right? Um, so essentially making steam is still how we make electricity, right? We heat things up, they expand. Um, this little infographic gives us an idea of the different stages of industry, right? The first stage is steam power and mechanization. So that's steam engines, coal burning chiefly, and taking jobs away from manual labor and moving them into factories. Um, the next stage is mass production, the production line, which we're going to talk about. Uh, the next stage is using computers and taking people further out. And then the last stage is uh, services provided by computers. So textiles are really where the industrial revolution begins right um, from the 15th century onwards cotton cloth was used as a means of exchange um, however british cloth soon couldn't compete with indian cloth because the wages were so much lower and cotton could be grown much closer so it didn't have to be imported and british cloth couldn't compete with indian cloth um, now in general before the industrial revolution we had what's called proto-industry, or a putting out system. What this means is that people lived and worked in their homes, and that one uh, sort of proto-capitalist would go around having people in their homes spin or weave. Often one weaver would have access to lots of spinners, right? So here's a merchant, he brings in his cotton, he takes this to the spinner's cottages, who spin it into yarn, he then takes it to the weaver's cottages who weave it into thread, 
Now it's finished cloth and he takes it into town and sells it. So we have the similar system to what we have in industry, but in this case, it's broken up over lots of different people's houses. And the difference here is in how people engage with their labor. If you're working from home in this proto-industrial setting, you don't have to clock in at a certain time. You don't have big industrial machines. You don't have children who have to be at work at a certain time. And your kids can work a little bit and they can go run around a little bit. You can work in between the times when you have stuff to do on your farm. It's not the only thing that you're doing. It's not a job in the same sense of clocking into a factory, doing a nine to five, doing a shift is a job. Um, so it, what changes is how people engage with this. And these various innovations make that possible. Um, one of them is the flying shuttle. Um, what this does is doubles the output of a weaver. So if we go back to our little graphic, we can see that there are weavers and spinners. Um, it makes weavers a lot more efficient than spinners. So you'd need several spinners to keep up with one weaver. Um, the next thing is a spinning jenny. Um, the spinning jenny and then the water frame, um, they both spin much faster. Um, one makes thick cloth, one makes soft cloth. They're combined in 1779 to make the spinning mule. Um, so when we begin with powering this with water, right, a water wheel before we have steam power, and this already makes these huge gains in production. Um, by 1781, um, cotton, um, cotton in 1781, the cotton span is 5.1 million pounds, tenfold increase, right, in this 19 year period. Um, and as you can see, this makes a huge impact on Britain's industrial economy. Um, now, we have all these different arguments about why the industrial revolution began in Britain. Um, I think, let me look how much longer we've got in this video. Uh, okay, three minutes, let's see if we can do it. Um, there are these various arguments, right? Um, one is culture, the idea that there's some unique Anglo-Saxon productive culture, and um, that's vaguely racist, and doesn't really line up with what we know to be true. And um, to his property rights, the idea that people can keep what they make, therefore are more inclined to try and make more. The third one is that there's a small population. Um, if there's always a surplus of people, you don't need to work out how to make labor more more productive because you can always just get more labor, right? Um, so in 1800, China, India, and Europe are roughly in the same place. Um, India had a huge population because of it, relatively efficient agriculture. Um, and that meant they could always rely on more labor, right? Um, but Britain had these two big benefits. One is coal. There are deposits of coal in Britain that they are mining. They can burn those for energy. Um, steam engines allow them to take that coal and turn it into energy. And then high wages in Britain mean that it makes sense to use machines to do jobs instead of using people because people become relatively expensive. Um, however, the conditions that these people live in are squalid to say the least right so here's a quote from lord byron here he is looking very pensive um so most factory workers in the industrial revolution are unmarried women and children they're not men because men were paid a male breadwinner wage so men were paid enough in theory to sustain the household it was cheaper to employ women and children especially orphans who were virtually free right they could work for 14 hours a day and um, they did not get better quality of life as uh, things changed. Um, they did not get better quality of life as the Industrial Revolution progressed. Um, living standards didn't grow meaningfully until the late 19th century. In many ways, their lives got worse. Um, so real wages only increased 15% from 1780 to 1850, and life expectancy doesn't really increase until the 1870s. And this causes a lot of distrust, a lot of upset. Um, and we're going to talk about that in the next 